taxi driver. Well, who the hell else are you talking? You talking to me? It really goes back to Brian De Palma. His independent cinema in Hollywood started saying, hey, maybe these in indie films could, these kids could work in the industry. And so we were all out in LA and he introduced me to Paul Schrader. Schrader wrote Taxi Driver. Travis comes from his vision, but more psyche. I connected with it through Dostoevsky's Notes from Underground. It was in, like enlightening, you know? And so for me, when I read the script, Brian gave it to me. He said, you know, I can't, I don't want to do it. I can't do it, but maybe you should do it. But I didn't have enough cachet, as they say, at that time to make the picture. But then they saw the rough cut of Main Streets and they changed their mind, especially when they saw De Niro in it. And so they said, for the two of you, we could probably get this film made. Why won't you talk to me? Why don't you answer my calls when I call? You think I don't know you're here? That's not we kept thinking in terms of the character and his loneliness and his acting out. Not condoning the acting out, but he does act out. And yet, an empathy with him, which is really tricky. We wanted to make it so badly nobody would make it that we were thinking of going to different cities to make it. San Francisco, Los Angeles. But the taxi driving wasn't the same. And we said, no, it has to be Manhattan. Ultimately, what stayed with us was the psychological and emotional state of that character. As we know now, tragically, it's a norm. Every other person is like Travis Bickle now. For me, the visualization of the movie was to always try to keep you off balance, keep the audience off balance. I felt that when he made that phone call, it was so painful, we shouldn't witness it. So the camera should track away, but not pan away. It should move completely to a hallway. And in the hallway, you think somebody's coming, but nobody's gonna come. Nothing's gonna happen. We're all alone. But we don't want to experience the depth of his pain at that point. And at the same time, there's a sense of anxiety on uh, the viewer. What's gonna happen in the hallway? Well, apparently nothing. That was the first shot I came up by, so that's the style. There's another thing too, where the, the taxi pulls up at the beginning of the film into the uh, taxi garage. Taxi is coming in, we're panning with it as it comes in. And normally it goes this way and the camera would pan with it and it, it stops. Well, as it came in, I went the other way. And as we rested, the car came in and stopped. Wait, I'm supposed to be looking at the car. No, we're gonna go another way. And so every shot, as much as possible, was uh, designed to be slightly disconcerting, but ultimately, ultimately satisfying. That was the philosophy of the, the shooting. Gangs of New York. Us natives, born right wise to this fine land, or the foreign hordes defiling it. Well, Gangs of New York comes out of the, those cobblestone streets around the, the church on Mott Street and Mulberry Street, and also coming off the other element that I grew up with really was the uh, Bowery. At that time, the Bowery was what you call now homeless. At that time, really basically alcoholics, guys dying in the streets basically. Very, very difficult place to grow up around and in. And so, but there was something about that Bowery and something about the neighborhood and the way the buildings were created and the cellars, the cellars, there's so many cellars. And my father would talk about growing up there and going into one building, going down the cellar and coming out two blocks away, running away from the cops, or some of the guys, you know. It, it had its own life. It, had, it was like an organism and it had a history. Well, then we got business. What do we do? With Leo DiCaprio, it was interesting because De Niro, we were acquainted with each other when we were 16 years old. So because of my relationship with him going back to when we were 16, he um, experienced what I experienced growing up. So he's the only one I know who, around, who's around that and who was working in that capacity that knows who I am, where I came from, and the world we were in. He then called me and said at one point, he just made a film called This Boy's Life, and he was working with this kid that he, he cast, named Leo DiCaprio. He said, he's very good, you gotta do work with him someday. And Bob never really used to tell me that, work with somebody, you know, just, we'd go from picture to picture if we worked together. And DiCaprio uh, liked our pictures, came together, and they said, why don't we, you've always wanted to do Gangs in New York, a bit. It, it, we started it many times, it got canceled. Here's a chance, this kid Leo DiCaprio really likes your films, at least meet with him. And uh, he was willing to go whatever I could do to make that film. So that's how it all started, with him coming off of Titanic and a couple of other films. Then we convinced Daniel Day to get into it as Bill the Butcher. And Daniel Day is very intense and very uh, specific actor. And what I love about working with him is that Daniel has a thing where 
if he starts, he stays in that character. People think it's kind of a mystique, but it really makes sense. And also, because if I'm talking to Bill the Butcher and in between takes, it's Daniel, I'm still talking to Bill. He stays in that character and he'll be one of the other actors Irish and he's not supposed to like the Irish and, you know, he treats that person that way. I don't give a tuppenny fuck about your moral conundrum, you meat-headed shit sack. And they said, why is he? I said, that, 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 that's what that is. Just, we're not playing. I mean, we're playing, but we're living it. <laughs> and so he's very good that way. Uh, DiCaprio's another way entirely. And he, he, he comes at a character from every possible angle. And we find that with Leo, most of the work is done before we shoot. Goodfellas. As far back as I could remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. Goodfellas was made 18 years after Mean Streets. So I didn't really want to go to do another genre, gangster genre, right? I, I mean, there is no main character. I mean, Ray Liotta is a wonderful actor, but he's like Virgil taking Dante through the underworld. The real character in the movie is the underworld. After doing the film Last Temptation of Christ, when I got back, I, I owed Warner Brothers Goodfellas, or became Goodfellas, it was called Wise Guys at the time. I didn't really, almost didn't want to make it. It was Michael Powell, the director of The Red Shoes, co-director, I should say, and other masterpieces who read the script and insisted I make it. Every shot may feel like a documentary, but the, the camera moves, everything you see, it's all, clearly, it's all there in the script. We had to stage bits of action Joe Reedy did and, and Michael Ballhouse, my cameraman, they worked out all the background action for the long Copacabana shot. All I said was, we start out in the front, he gives the guy the money, next thing you know, we go through the thing, we go through here, we go through here, we go through here, we go, you know, we wind up on the famous comic, Henny Youngman. Everything has to flow with no obstruction. He's got to impress her. They send him bottles of champagne. Everybody knows him. That's his height. So that shot had to be. And I wanted Joe Pesci to be in the film and um, I think he resisted it. I know he resisted it. He said, I don't know, gangster stuff. And I said, yeah, but Joe, I said, this character's really interesting, based on a real, real guy. Really funny, <laughs> <laughs> really funny. Uh -huh. uh, what do you mean I'm funny? <laughs> and he said, well, I, if you do it, I gotta tell you something. And I said, well, what is it? He goes, not here. And he acted out this scene that happened to him. I knew exactly where to put it. Went through the scene over and over again, recorded it all, each take. And then I created it from the actor's improvisations and try to make sure that it accelerated the right way because the slightest change, you know, of like, why am I funny? Uh, uh, what do you mean I'm funny? I'm not funny. Otherwise, it'd be just repetitious. Funny like I'm a clown. I amuse you. I make you laugh. I'm here to fucking amuse you. What do you mean funny? Funny how? How am I funny? And I decided we'd just do it with two cameras. We squeeze it in on a day that we're, wasn't scheduled. The two cameras would be wide, medium wide shots because it was important to see not just, there are no close-ups. It was important to see Joe's character and Ray's character in relation to the people around them. And while the intensity builds, you see the body language of everybody around them change. And it just happens. And I said, well, that's even better. You know, so close-ups, no, let's get out of here. You know, and we shot it like in an hour and a half. I improvised too with the bottle breaking on, on Tony Dyro's head and that sort of thing. He had the nerve to ask to pay the bill. <laughs> The Departed. Those guys you tuned up, they're connected down Providence. What they're gonna do is come back with some guys and kill you. I always wanted to work with Jack Nicholson and be in a film and I offered him the part and then he said, you know, give me something to play. And he was right. Because the way the script was, a Bill Monahan script, which is a very good script, but the character of Costello was still presented as your generic big shot gangster. He hears this young kid in town who just beat up somebody in a bar. He calls him in, checks him out, and then he says, come and talk to me. Because he looks at him and says, maybe I can use this kid. We've seen that scene many times in Westerns, in gangster films, because it's very truthful. That's what happens. You could do it in business, too. Suddenly you make a big hit with something and everybody calls you. And they want to see what you can do for them. In this case, it's the underworld. And there was a scene where he's eating a lobster lunch, it said in his apartment and he has this kid coming. The basic line was, what can you do for me? What, you wanna work with me, you're a tough guy, what can you do for me? I'd seen that scene many times. And Nicholson said, what if, call me, he said, what if while we're at lunch, on the table in a little plastic bag is a severed human hand? I said, now that's a job interview. 
And you never mention it. Don't even discuss it. We went off on a whirlwind of the fact that Costello would be losing control and in a sense, losing his mind, really. That's something that uh, was very controversial at the time. Some people went with it, some didn't. But the thing was that I, I was around a situation like that when I was growing up, where somebody very powerful, who was eventually killed in 1968, was, in effect, losing his mind and killing people. An atmosphere of fear that I saw around that area that um, was what I wanted to capture and departed. Worse than that, these guys were all informers on each other. And it's true. In a world where everyone is informing on each other now. Complain about the guy, well, he's out of his mind, he's overdoing. No, that's, imagine, that's in effect what it would be like. You're completely under um, his control and he's out of his mind. And that's what I feel the world is like right now. Raging Bull. Jimmy, with everything you got, I want you to fucking lay me out. Go ahead. You sure? Yeah. yeah. All right. Hot. The 70s studio system changed a great deal, and the week that film was released was the same week from the same studio that Michael Cimino's Heaven's Gate opened. That, a Raging Bull, Apocalypse Now, all from the same studio, United Artists. That ended what the 70s, they call this, you know, golden age, that sort of, but really it ended, it ended the power of um, the director, in a way, in American filmmaking. And that had to come back through independent cinema, another way through the 80s. The 70s was very much that way because things were wide open. And we went in and we took it, like the barbarians at the gate, and we transformed whatever we could, but they caught us. Raging Bull was a, uh, we threw everything we knew into it, not knowing how it was gonna be received. We understood that people didn't like him, and even the crew, it turned out. I didn't know until later, why are we making a film about this guy? He's a horror. And, but we stayed with it. This man may be this way, but still, he's a human being, he's got a heart, he's got a soul. By the end of it, he finds some kind of peace with himself and maybe the others around him. And I think I was going there to try to find peace in myself. That year, there were, I think, four more films coming out about boxing. The, the main event with uh, Barbara Streisand, Prize Fighter with Tim Conway, Matilda the Boxing Kangaroo, and Rocky II also. And they were all in color. That's when I realized that we should go black and white. And also the black and white would work a distinctively different from the other boxing films that were being made, comedies and, and Rocky II. And also um, Irwin Winkler pointed out to the studio that the films that were made in black and white up to that point in the 70s were um, Paper Moon and Lenny, and they were hits. I also thought, too, that the boxing scenes had to be very powerful. The rest of the film, anything else, was concentrated in an almost meditative state in terms of framing, holding those people in that frame. But the boxing scenes would be like you're on another planet. Primarily it was based on, I came up with the idea when I was doing Last Waltz, being on the stage with the band and I watching how the band worked. The ballet sequences from Red Shoes, where you don't really necessarily go head to toe where you see the dancer. Instead, you see what's inside the mind of the dancer. What's in the mind and what's the perception of the fighter in the ring? They don't even know where they are sometimes. The Wolf of Wall Street. They're gonna need to send in the National Guard a fucking SWAT team, cause I ain't going nowhere! Again, like Raging Bull, I didn't want to make it, but I had to find my own way in it. And a lot of it had to do with style. The style I felt originally was more like Goodfellas. I had done it. And I did it again in Casino. What more could I bring to it? And we found a way, and that was ultimately through his character. And the whole idea of untethered capitalism. This is the spirit of it. Anything goes because you're making money. It doesn't matter. Now, it's a little bit that way too in Casino, but Casino has organized crime. It's a different thing. This is organized another way. And so with that understanding, then I was able to play with the structure of it and make it right away. First three or four minutes of the film, you could see right away this is gonna be something unexpected. Uh, like every other shot, is something shocking going on in a way, or supposedly shocking. In order to do that, you have to have somebody who's playing that part be prepared to do anything. And he did. I would provoke him, he'd provoke me, and we'd go further. If you read the book, we could have gone even further. Mean Streets. Hey, 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 what's the matter with this kid, huh? Hey, there ain't nothing wrong with me, my friend. I'm feeling fine. Keep your mouth shut. Hey, you told me that in front of this asshole. I was living in the late 50s into the early 60s down in my old neighborhood of what they used to call Little Italy 
at that time, it really was a little Italy. Families were loving, but you know, it was it was the tenements, and it was a, a not a really good place. And they were good people, but at the same time, it was steeped in a kind of organized crime. The mean Streets comes out of that violence, which I missed by chance, really. Now's the time. I was with these people in this car. I told my friend was with me and we're in the back seat. And I said, oh, it's two o'clock in the morning. This is nonsense. Let's go home. He said, yeah, yeah, okay, let's go home. The car drove off and they got shot. It had to do with a lot of street power, so to speak, a sense of certain rules that the underworld works with. And a lot of it had to do with, am I my brother's keeper? It also reflects my father and his youngest brother. My father was one of eight children. His youngest brother was always in jail, always in trouble. And my father was always trying to broker uh, situations where he wouldn't get killed. He has about $30. It's always got on him, Michael. Where's the rest? Yeah, where's the rest? The extent to which one is your real brother or one is uh, such a close friend that you put yourself on the line is something that's really important to me in terms of how you live a life and try to live a, a good moral life, but you're in a world that is completely corrupt. You don't make up for your sins in the church. You do it in the streets. You do it at home. And that's that's the essence of Mean Streets. That's what I talk about in the beginning. You know, you can go to church all you want, but the real acting out of your morality is outside the church. It's outside the building of the church. It's in the home, it's with your friends and that. All the rest is an illusion. I was five years old in New York. It was the late 40s, my, we had a television. 16 inch. On Friday nights, there was a, an Italian film shown for the Italian American community. And uh, my grandparents would come over and uh, they didn't speak English, only Sicilian. And my mother and father, my uncles, and we'd get around this little TV set and we see The Bicycle Thief. It had these words in the bottom. The people that were speaking in the film, they were speaking the same way as, as my family. Those Italian films were more than cinema. They were a form of truth that I related to because it it somehow had something to do with who I who I am. And so no matter what I shoot, uh, it isn't directly uh, saying, oh, we're gonna do a shot now from The Bicycle Thief. No, it's the emotional and, and uh, psychological impact of experiencing that film when I was five or six in the room with these people who lived it. The Irishman. I don't, I don't know, it sounds, it sounds funny. It stops, it starts, it loses power. Let me see if I can give you a hand. Over the years, seeing the, the difference in the technology, one of the key things to give us the energy to make our first films, features, was John Cassavetes doing Shadows in 16 millimeter, which came from France with the Eclair camera. So all of that happening at that time made it that we could make a film ourselves. We didn't have to have the studio behind us with giant lights and giant Mitchell BNCs. I've kind of stayed pretty much traditional. We edit now with the computer, but I don't really know how to do that. Thelma does it. If I can utilize the new technology for the kind of story I want to make, why not go there? And so in the case of uh, Irishman, De Niro and I had this idea for a long time and I, again, I didn't want to do another uh, gangster uh, genre. Part of the problem was flashbacks. And by the time we got to do it, he was too old to play his younger self. And they said, well, a different actor. And I said, well, what's, then it's not like us making a film together. What's the point? And so we were talking about this idea of uh, youthification. And Pablo Herman of ILM was with us doing CGI or background material for us in Taiwan where we're doing silence. And he came up and he said, I think I can do it. What I have seen is that people have to wear golf balls on their faces. You can't have a scene with Joe Pesci and Bob De Niro and Al Pacino or whatever, and they all have golf balls on their faces. And they're the kinds of actors that, that kind of thing, for this kind of movie, it doesn't work. And eventually, by the end of the shoot of silence, he, he had it. And we did a test with Bob and we with De Niro, and we tried it, and we all felt strongly about it. The drawback was the financially because it was extremely expensive and also length of time. It was an extra five to six months in the post-production. That's when Netflix came in and really helped us. It's not just CGI. We accept it if a person puts on a fat suit or you paint their hair white, or they're supposed to be old. But what if you do it digitally? It's like makeup. It's just taking that leap of, of saying, oh, no, it's gotta be the, what the old way to, this is, this is now a transformation into a new way. Silence.
things that happened when I was making Last Temptation that took me only up to a certain point. I found myself wanting more, and I found it in silence. And when I read the book, I was in Japan, actually. It was 1989, and I tried to write a version of the script with my friend Jay Cox uh, by 1990, 92, but I didn't get it. And it took me years, another 10, 12 years, to live a life and experience with different exploration, going making kundun, for example, on the Dalai Lama, all of these things. And uh, finally, by around 2006, 2007, I was able to put the script together. I felt that we, we could do it. Too many technical business problems and almost made it impossible to get made, but eventually it did. Ang Lee's group helped us to shoot in Taiwan, you know. A special experience for the entire crew making the film. The locations, the people, the scenes themselves, what the Japanese actors, I mean, it was really a, a kind of spiritual journey. Killers of the Flower Moon. Their time is over. It's taken six years. We didn't intend to take it six years, but I was making The Irishman, and then there was COVID. I was given the book and read the book, and I was very excited by that. I didn't quite know how to go about it. Eric Roth and I went through a process of a few years of pulling the script together and the story, and there were some wonderful things in it. We got it to a point where we said, let's sit down and read this thing. I got some friends, we sat down, Leo was there, Eric it was good, but there was something about it that I felt we'd been there before, and that was the idea of a police procedural. And the character that he was supposed to play, Tom White, was a character that is straight-laced, you know, very strong, very proper guy. And so we thought about it for another week and a half, and then Leo came to me, said, where's the real, he came to me, said, where's the real heart of this picture? I said, the heart is with this guy, Ernest, and his wife, Molly. The only problem is we don't know anything about Ernest. Everybody else who got tons of material on, we don't know anything about him. So we came up with the idea of what if, instead of coming from the outside in, what if we go from the inside out? Then I said, oh yeah, the story really is the relationship of Ernest and Molly and the betrayal. I said, the only problem there is that it's a creative problem, which is you take the script, you turn it inside out. And how much of procedural do you need? Not very much. It started to come together. It gave me the direction that I felt comfortable in. The other way I've seen that kind of moves, I enjoy doing it. Imagine doing horses and running in Western tropes, in a way they call it. I would love that, but I've seen it. And they did it so much better. Everybody else does it better. So here, though, you're in the house, and there's a husband and wife, and this guy is dodgy. He's being manipulated by this uh, sort of angel of death, his uncle. You know, you got, you got nice color skin. What color would you say that is? My color. We had been working on the casting for quite a while, including uh, indigenous people. She says, I have somebody I want you to see. But then I saw this scene from Certain Women, Kelly Reichardt's film. I thought she was wonderful. And after COVID, we got to meet. I was struck by the uh, a whole visage, the face, and her intelligence. One could see that there's a lot going on in her face, but her not doing very much, which is perfect for film acting. Also, the intelligence and level of, of, of understanding and of coming from indigenous people and being an activist we could learn from her, which is what we did. And we all worked together, myself, her, and Leo, very, very closely. 